Good evening. Not much of a change in location tonight. We're going to be down in the gutter among the rats and the garbage. But first, here's Ted with a rundown. The stars are descending on Vancouver for this weekend's 21st Variety Club Telethon. In the studio with Webster, award-winning actress Nanette Fabre, and the younger brother of our very own Yukon Eric, Leslie Nielsen. But first, are the Tories abusing the privilege of political patronage? Canadians want to know when the Prime Minister is going to stop using the highest elected office in the land as a post for jobs and graft for old friends and cronies of the Prime Minister. Webster reviews Mulroney's record with Burnaby MP Sven Robinson. But first of all, a social note with my old antagonist, the aforesaid Sven Robinson. Been in court lately for contempt? Not for about a year, Jack, actually. Uh, what w I forget what that was, Sven. What was that? It was a while back, Jack. It's a little fuzzy for me as well, but... Uh, Lyle Island? Lyle Island, that was it, Jack. And yeah. you, a lawyer and an MP, were found to be in contempt? Myself and uh, nine Haida Indians were found to be in contempt of an order of the court. You mean nine Haida Indians with you tacking on to the end? No, I only wanted to remind people about it. But what was the fine? I think it was $750. $750. Well, as I say in Scotch law, you have sold your assize. Now, as one of the sharpest critics of this rather troubled Tory government, I want you, Sven Robinson, accused of being down in the gutter with the rats and the garbage. That's what he said to you the other day, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah. What had you said to him? Mulroney, that is. What I had said to him was what you just saw, Jack, on, on television, that uh, Canadians, mm -hmm. my constituents, the oh, people yeah. of British Columbia, were getting tired of a prime minister who uses his office to benefit his old college friends and cronies and so on, that they voted the last government out because they wanted a change, mm -hmm. and they haven't seen that change. Well, I know that you and Ed Broadbent, whom I had on the other night, are floating high, white, and handsome in the polls, but I want you to tell me, of all the mistakes which you see of the Tory government and Mulroney, what was the worst from the point of view, do you think, of upsetting the public? There have been so many that it's difficult to single one out. Try. But I will try. I, mm -hmm. I, I would have to say that, uh, as much as anything else, just because of the sort of symbolic significance of it, it was the decision of Mulroney to take a prison, which wasn't needed at all, and plunk it in the middle of nowhere in northern Quebec in a riding which just happened to be the riding that he represents. Now, the prison wasn't needed, and it's costing the taxpayers of Canada $42 million a year extra. And on top of that, the contracts for the prison just happen to have gone to old friends and acquaintances of the Prime Minister. Well, I would venture to suggest that that, in the meantime, had been forgotten altogether in the flurry of all the other scandals and near scandals. Is that not so? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, as, as we de deal with these other scandals, and I think, quite rightly, Canadians are sort of getting a bit fed up with, with scandal-a-day government, but as we deal with these other scandals, I think we have to not lose sight of the fundamental principle here. And the okay. fundamental principle is that, that the people that are elected to public office should not be using that public office for personal benefit. It should not be a perception that their friends are using it for personal benefit. Exactly. There's been no direct allegations of any personal impropriety against Mr. Mulroney, has there? Oh, no, no. I mean, every friend and, and, and acquaintance and crony of Crony is it. Uh, you know, from all the talking. senators and appointments and all yeah. the rest of it. But let me pretend that I'm a good, that I'm Crosby for the moment. You know, and you, you're the guy that gives all this filth and rumors and scandal to the media who run along with it like lap dogs and push it out to destroy the Moroni government. Right now in this Rock La Salle business where there's an accusation that people paid three five thousand dollars cash to go to a party in the perception that they would get some government contacts, Moroni acted properly as soon as he heard of that, did he not? He acted properly as soon as he heard of it uh, by calling in the RCMP because there was a potential breach of the law. But, Jack, you have to ask yourself, how on earth is this government functioning when the RCMP is becoming preoccupied with, uh, with scandals of this government? Surely the job of the RCMP is not to, uh, to act as some sort of investigative agency for Brian Mulroney's government. Oh, it must, where there's a perception that the law has been breached, does it not? Of course, but 
you know, I, I was around during the time of the Liberal government, and you were, you were an observer of that government as well, and the patronage was bad, and they were a lousy government. They deserved to be thrown out. But, Jack, one of the things that we didn't see, and I think this is fair, one of the things that we didn't see is the extent to which this government, the Mulroney government, in fact, a whole series of ministers, appear to be, in effect, taking advantage of their office to help their friends and their business colleagues make money. And that's the difference here. And I think that's why Canadians are responding in the way that we've seen in the recent polls. Well, it just means that uh, the Maloney massive majority has a number of people unskilled in the most smooth and sophisticated way of helping your friends. Is that not a good logical answer when you look back even at, or not even, at the Liberals' performance? They had many nasty little things around the corner, didn't they? Oh, goodness knows the Liberals were, were not much better. But the reality is that there's another problem here, too, and that's that in this whole process of, of, of handing out contracts mm. and awards and so on, there seems to be, at least there's a possibility, of some sort of toll-gating practice. In other words, if you want a contract with this government, give us some money. Like many years ago in British Columbia, way back 40 years ago, for every battle of beer there was 50 cents that went to one, some party or another in power in British Columbia. Exactly, exactly. And, and but of course you're in a great position as a federal NDP because you have never ever been in power and you can be holier than holier from now until the time you get power. I think what we can do is look at the record of NDP governments provincially and I don't think there's been an NDP government ever in which there's been any kind of suggestion of this nature of... Oh, patronage of, appointments, of, yes. Of, uh, ...of abuse of office to, to benefit people through contracts. All right, let's go from that to what I regard as the kind of major embarrassment for Mulroney, and that is the Bissonnette. Again, where he said, odious and unacceptable, the minister's gone, in come the RCMP. Now, that was pretty sharp action. Again, but you say there's a fault in that. Yeah. He had to do that, of course. I mean, when you've got a minister, a Tory minister, who allegedly has pocketed some $900,000 because he happened to know uh, where the uh, where the Orlikon plant was going to be built. That's the allegation. Now, we don't know, you know whether, in fact, that's accurate, but that is the allegation. Um, that raises not just questions of criminal wrongdoing, Jack, but it also raises pretty serious questions about possible conflicts of interest, for example. Who else in the government may have been involved in this? So you want case? another, you want an inquiry into that. Now, the Stevens inquiry, God knows, has gone on far too long. Bonanza for okay. lawyers. And I'm sure it could have been, if the terms of reference had been tight, that it could have been finished long ago. Mm -hmm. If we have one in the Bissonnette and we have one in La Salle, they won't be over before the next election. I'm not suggesting that you have to have a full-blown judicial inquiry. We've got something now in this country called parliamentary committees. Ah, that's We've got something called parliamentary reform. I have never understood why we as members of, of, of Parliament, Jack, in committees can't do the same kind of thorough job that American congressional committees have done. You don't need to hire a judge and... Agreed, but you can see why. If you were Prime Minister, why Moroni or Trudeau would go to a judge because it uh, doesn't mean, it means that not half a dozen opposition members are sitting there sharpening the stilettos on every occasion when they can ask a question for television. Well, it's more gentle with a judicial inquiry. It's more gentle, but, you know, if you're, what we are saying is that there, there are broader political implications. Is this government abusing the trust of Canadians? That's what it comes down to. Has this Prime Minister lost credibility and trust of Canadians because his government simply doesn't understand that credibility and public morality are important to Canadians. And then there's the other one which seems a bit overblown by the opposition. The phone call from Senator Cogger, wasn't it? Yeah. Who was acting for Wolf. Yes. Who's the guy who's supposed to have supplied the offshore money for the Dump Joe Clark movement. That's right. But that's surely a question where a Moroni allegedly spoke to somebody about saying, get off my... Well... I'll settle this case out of court. Look. We are in a situation now where we've got a scandal a day, and instead of dealing with the very serious economic problems of the country, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, what's happening with the Polarade icebreaker for British Columbia? But for maybe example? that's where you people are overdoing it. Maybe you should lay off the House of Commons a little bit and let it get down to business. Look, at, we'd love to let the House of Commons get down to business, and we have been raising issues on the Cod War, on the sellout to the multinational drug companies, on the generic drug issue, uh, with respect to the, uh, the old age pensions, with respect to uh, uh, the, uh, the... Unemployment insurance unemployment, for re uh, early retirees. Uh, unemployment uh, in this country. 13% in British Columbia, nothing in Ontario. Food banks, I mean, it's a, it's a scandal that we've still got people lining up around the block to get food in this province. Now, More those are the issues we should be dealing with. 
What do you think of Robinson? No, have Adam on these issues. And I'll have some questions to after the break. Canadians want to know when the Prime Minister is going to stop using the highest elected office in the land as a post for jobs and graft for old friends and cronies of the Prime Minister. The honorable member who consistently makes in this chamber eloquent speeches on the need, the sanctity of individual rights and the presumption of innocence yeah, is with the preamble of his question right down in the gutter with the rats and the garbage. And the Prime Minister got you there when he pointed out you're the great defender of the law. Except for your own odd little problem. And uh, t people have to be judged, have got to be regarded as innocent until proven guilty. The facts speak for themselves. We're not trying anyone. When you look down the list of the friends of the Prime Minister, Michel Cogger, an old buddy, he's gone to the Senate. Right. Jean Bazin, an old friend from college days, he's gone, gone to, the, to Senate. the Senate. Person after person uh, has been appointed by the Prime Minister to various positions. Bernard Waugh. Nothing on wrong and on with patronage if it's to help implement your policies because you would do the same. It, there's nothing wrong with hiring good people that happen to have your political philosophy. But mm. what we see in this government, for example, is the recent appointments to the human rights tribunals. Now, these are very important tribunals, and I know it's not a big issue. Oh, no, that's a good but, issue. But if you remember what happened there, what they did is they appointed people who knew nothing whatsoever about human rights. In fact, some of them bragged about that. And they're only... And cleaned up the curriculum vitae. And they cleaned up the curriculum vitae. They doctored the curriculum vitae to eliminate any reference to the Conservative Party. You see, I Party. say cleaned up, you say doctor. Okay, well, it's the same difference. We know what we're talking about. And, uh, and when you looked at the curriculum vitae, what did you see? You saw a woman from Vancouver that I'm not going to name because she means well, but on her curriculum vitae, she said, I have worked hard for the Conservative Party for the last two years and I'm still learning. Well, that was her only well, I like better the citizenship court judge in uh, Toronto, I think it was, who said, I think, you know, are you going to vote Tory? Sure. What's to that effect? Yeah. And that is abuse of patronage. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. he's in solid for another two years, is he well, not? Well, he's pretty shaky right now, but uh, I'm not one of those ones that writes off the government at this point. I think once your credibility has been destroyed, it's very, very difficult to get it back. And I think many Canadians just have stopped believing the Prime Minister. And, and of uh, course, you're kind of embarrassed yourself in some issues where you split with the provincials. All you people are against the 15% solution, and provincially your party supports the 15% solution, and so does Jack Monroe. Look, we are a national political party, and we have to take a national perspective. Oh. I think it's wrong. I think it's wrong for the Americans to be able to dictate to Canada how we can spend that money. All right. That's Enough. where I think the basic problem is. I want to change the subject. Yeah. Capital punishment. The government today introduced uh, a motion, motion right, yeah. to reinstitute capital punishment, yeah. right? And it will be a free vote, it's except for the NDP. Oh, it'll be a free vote in the NDP as well. Where do you stand? Sven Robinson used to be the youngest MP in the House of Commons at 27, you're now 34. Where do you stand on capital punishment? I'm opposed to capital punishment. Totally and uh, unalterably. Absolutely, and I think it's really quite unfortunate that Parliament is, is going to be going through this whole emotional, divisive, destructive debate all over again when we should be debating serious issues, including, for example, uh, how to prevent violent crime, how to deal with the victims of crime, because as you know, Jack, if we reinstate capital punishment, we're not going to save any more lives, and there will be innocent people who are executed. It, it, yeah, it will, however, satisfy many, a majority of the members of the Canadian public who strongly object to seeing serial killers being looked after for the rest of their lives. I suppose that's yeah. the difference, is that's, it not? There's no question. They want vengeance, yeah. you want civilized behavior. I don't think that the state tells people thou shalt not kill by killing people. Go ahead, please. Yeah, this level of sleaze of the government, I mean, I, as a Canadian, I'm just absolutely embarrassed by it. And now I see recently we've got an international company, Orlicon, comes in here to invest some money and uh, it's subject to being shaked down by uh, friends of the government. And, uh, you know, I ask myself, what does this do to our reputation? in the international business community when we're trying to attract investment to, uh, to Canada. I don't think it'll even be noticed by the international investment community. Do you, Sven? No, I think the gentleman's got a point. Uh, you know, it, it should be that uh, contracts are awarded on the basis of, of merit, the ability to do the job, and that's why the people were so angry about the CF-18 contract, for oh, example. Yeah. We should have gotten right. that in the West, eh? 
Not different, no. But that's a different issue. But the gentleman is right. In the case of Orlicon, they were prepared to pay whatever it costs. But let's not forget, it's not Orlicon that pays in the end. It's you and me and the taxpayers of this country. And that's, that's a that's billion dollar con contract for a low level defense system for the Canadian forces in Europe. A, it's a billion dollar contract. And as the gentleman says, if, if, if the international investment community starts thinking that to do business with his government, you got to slip a few thousand dollars to the right person or maybe go to a dinner party with Rock LaSalle, there's something very wrong. Mind you, if you come to power, and I suppose there is a pos prospect of it, or even to be official opposition, there certainly won't be any billion dollar contract for the defense of the Canadian troops in Europe, will there? We, as you know, Jack, have advocated that Canada have an independent foreign policy, and uh, that uh, and involves, involves not being involved in any of the major military alliances. Out of NERAD, 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 what is it? NORAD. NORAD <laughs> and NATO. <laughs> Thanks for your call, old boy. That's one against laziness. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Robinson. What about uh, yourself and the scandals you've been involved with, like living in low rental housing and your episode with the Haidas? I'd just like to hang up and hear your reflection on that. Fair game. <laughs> well, when you say... Living in low rent, low, Something wrong with me. Low rental housing. Living in low rental housing, I... I Do you I, live in a co-op housing unit? I think what the gentleman is referring to is the fact that I have, for the last almost nine years, lived in a co-op housing unit. Uh, I don't make any apologies about that whatsoever. Uh, I've lived there since the time I was an article law student, well before I was elected. Uh, I uh, have paid a surcharge uh, uh, in the co-op be because of the fact that uh, about half the people in the co-op are single-parent families. Uh, and my rent is, in fact, above the market rent for a one-bedroom unit, which is what I have. And I think that my rent is my own business. But you got a benefit of 2% mortgage money from CMHC on that co-op housing. I don't think that we want people to live in low in, in low income ghettos, Jack. And I think if I, as a member of parliament in my community of Burnaby, want to continue living where I've lived all along and it happens to be a co-op, I think I'm entitled to do that. You're saying with some justification that you add a touch of class to the co-op. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that certainly I don't detract from it. First time you refuse to answer a question. No, I don't want to know your rent. $750 a month. It's not $750. No. $650 a month. What are you paying, Jack? $1,000 a month. $1,000 a month. Well, I pay less than that. $900 a month? Well, tell me. Got to have a laugh now and again. How much do you get? $70,000? Something like that. Go ahead, please. Yes, hello, Mr. Webster, Mr. Robinson. Uh, my question is uh, to Mr. Robinson. I'd like your opinion as the NDP justice critic. Uh, with regards to the recent firing of an immigration officer in Toronto, a Mr. John Quigley, mm, yeah. Yeah. fired for reporting to the Commons Immigration Committee that criminals were being sent letters inviting them to apply for refugee status. I'm especially concerned about this because of the John Michael Lewis situation, a convicted child molester who's been allowed to stay in Canada with the blessing of a local immigration appeal board. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let's yeah. go to that Toronto one. Yeah. Uh, well, look, I, I think the woman has made an excellent, the caller's made an excellent point, Jack. And uh, just yesterday in the House, members of Parliament from all three parties raised concerns about this. I mean, what kind of country is it in which uh, a public servant who, uh, who strongly believes that there's something wrong going on in government tries to bring it to the attention of his superiors, as Quigley did, gets nowhere, then says, okay, well, if, I, if my superiors won't do something about this, I'll go to the people that are elected to do something. And these are the superiors who are too stupid to put a stop to this somewhat nonsensical Turkish invasion by applying visas to them to enter this country. Exactly, exactly. So he says, okay, I can't get anything out of my superiors. I'll go to members of parliament. That's what he did. Uh, it was recognized after the MPs got involved that the practice had to stop. It was wrong. Now the guy loses his job. I mean, that's absolutely I don't think you MPs realize, you're all terribly sophisticated and liberalized and all the rest of it, but I don't think you MPs realize that when the minister of the government says, if there are another 155 Tamils in boats from West Germany, they can land here and be refugees, people resent that. Ordinary yeah. people resent that. Do you agree with me on that? Not only do ordinary people resent that, Jack, I must say that I'd send I, them back to West Germany. I, I as, as, as the member of parliament for Burnaby, and someone that has dealt with people who have waited for a mm. long, long time legitimately you resent to get into the country, I have the same kind of concerns. More with Sven Robinson after the break. Tell me how much he pays in his core. Oh well. 
Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, Mr. Robinson, I was wondering if you could uh, maybe fill us in a little on what appears to be at first glance to be another scandal in the making, and that's this sale today of uh, Teleglobe Canada to some minor player in the high-tech field called Memotech, which uh, on reading the financial post of this week, there's absolutely no mention of this firm at all in the bidding process for the company itself. And here okay. we go selling a federal firm, a moneymaker, to some low-ball player. It almost appears that the first caller got it right. Shakedown artists are at work. Oh, come off it. You can't say that about that particular operation besides Barbara McDougall is guiding it through the house. And she is, you know, perfecto, it would seem, on the face of it. Well, the, the gentleman has raised an important point, though. I think there's a more fundamental question. Why has the government decided in their ideological fetish to get rid of Teleglobe in the first place? As Barbara yeah. said, they will have more freedom to raise more money, to do new things, to employ more people, and it is a conservative philosophy, in case you hadn't noticed, to get out of crime corporations and to privatize as often as efficiently as possible. Whether or not they'll ever do it good, I don't, well, I don't know, but that's the answer, is it not? Well, that, that's the answer they give. I don't buy that answer. They say they're concerned about the deficit, the company was a profit maker, and I think that we should have kept it in the public sector. But you're a socialist. You would socialize every little thing in the country. Jack, I'm not going to bother trying to answer that kind of nonsense. You know that what we would do in Makes fact is a mixed economy in which the, the major sectors of the economy would be much more democratic and accountable. Here, yeah, here, yeah, yeah. Jolly good show. Go ahead, please. From Houston, B.C. Yes, good evening, Jack. Good evening, sir. And would you please cool down before I make my next question? And what do you think about the F-18 contract? Okay. Do you not know about the Bristol Aerospace Company. Now listen, sir, that's a bit of old history. He's already given me his view on the CF-18 contract. He thinks it should have gone to Winnipeg, don't yeah, you? Absolutely. That's right, and it was a yeah. good example of uh, looking after Montreal. It was a good example of them looking at the number of seats in Quebec and doing what the Liberals used to do and ignoring the West. And what you want them to do here in the West, you want us to get the Polaroid icebreaker? So do I. Even if it's not economic. I had two fellows from my riding in my office this afternoon in South Burnaby, Jack. They both have been out of work at the shipyard up there, and I think that if there's any sense of fairness in this government at all, it's about time that they announce that the Polar 8 is going to come to British Columbia. Absolutely. Well, first of all, they had to rescue the company that's going to do it. Well, there may be an, uh, an element of that, but, I mean, they've been prepared to bail out companies uh, in Ontario and Quebec Bombardier now. Bombardier uh, and all the rest of these uh, people. Uh, yes, it's yes. about time for British Columbia to, to, to have its share. Uh, next call, please, Jeanette. Go ahead, please. Yes, is that me, Jack? That's you. Yeah, I just want to comment about uh, Mr. Robinson being a justice critic. I think if he'd show a little bit more maturity, instead of starting to be a bit of a crusader out west, he might do more for his party. And in particular, the Haida issue, which I think is a federal issue. And if he's to be a justice critic, he should realize that that's a, that's a federal responsibility and should have been initiated at that point. Uh, I'm, there's no doubt that the Conservatives are in serious trouble, and out here in the West they're going to be probably suffering very badly. But he's not the type of person that's going to help them much unless he starts to show a little bit more responsibility on these issues. Well, perhaps I could just respond briefly on the Haida thing without going back into the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. I think that this was one of the most fundamental issues in terms of the future of this province, not just in terms of the, the land claim of the Haida Nation, uh, a nation which is strong and which needs that land for its survival, uh, but also in terms of the environmental uniqueness of South Moresby and Lyle Island. Well, don't let's it stop. A, but no, I can't, was a, cannot a, let you away with that. That is... I a, cannot let you away with that. Jack, you've got to go up to Windy Bay. I've been at Windy Bay. I know all about yeah. the Muddlelands. Yeah. I know all yeah. about the ecological reserve. Yeah. The provincial government was stupid, even to indicate they might go into Windy Bay. But don't tell me Lyle Island is a jewel on the crown of the environmental heritage of British Columbia. The 650 square miles on the west coast, which is untouched, and can easily be transferred to the environmental park that you and Suzuki and everybody else wants. Meanwhile, we've got no jobs in this province, and we need what reasonable logging and lumbering jobs we have and pulp mills. And if we don't stop treating the forest resource properly instead of oh, clear cutting that and, is and paps, replanting, then that is we're not going to have a resource left at all. That is motherhood, and we're all no, totally in agreement with motherhood. No, no, well, most of us are, I think. No, I can't let you away with 
nuts, man. You took cheap political yeah, advantage of the not. hiatus. Yes, oh, come on. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Oh, I've had that one. What do you mean a call from Calgary? Should we take a call from Calgary? Calgary? Yes, Mr. Webster. You are, far. Are you watching the program? You bet I am. On a satellite? Yes. Mm -hmm. I just want to compliment Mr. Robinson. We moved to Calgary from Vancouver, and I don't know if people there really respect him and appreciate him. We have a representative who, of course, is conservative, Alberta being what it is. What is Alberta? Conservative. For the time being. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're going to sweep Alberta. You got to... There was a by-election which just took place in Alberta, and we came within a whisker of winning a seat near Edmonton. You might get uh, four seats in Alberta, four seats in Quebec, 34 seats in British Columbia, 50 in... Ontario. You can get 100 anyway, seats. We're interrupting this very intelligent caller. No, here. it's a praiseworthy call. Have you anything nasty to say to Sven? <laughs> I just... Like, our representative is possibly not even eligible to vote. What do you mean? Oh, no, no. I don't ask or you'll tell me the answer. But thanks for your call from Calgary. It used to be one of yours. One you lost. Go ahead, please. Yeah, kind of in response to uh, that last caller. I'm a young entrepreneur here in B.C. And uh, I, as a former uh, P.C. voter and a critic of Sven Robinson, I'd like to support uh, a young man from B.C. doing a good job questioning the politics which I feel have gone off kilt of the election promises. He means kilter. Well, that's very good of you to say, sir. And I might say, as a, as a young entrepreneur, I think that you would agree with me that one of the areas that this government has promised to move in but hasn't moved in is the whole area of more support for research and development in this country to create new jobs and also tax reform to help small businesses to, uh, to promote their products. We're not doing it. They're cutting back. Well, there's so much happening in this province. Uh, yeah, pe people find that hard to believe from NDP, though, because you've got such a a range of uh, strong opinions in the NDP. When you, look, when you look at the record of the NDP government in British Columbia, Jack, and some people like to forget about that, we were the government that in fact took significant steps to help small business in this province. BC. We lowered the tax rate right here in British Columbia. That and did and a it's lot of good things. It's the federal conservative government that is really helping out the big boys, the, the multinational drug companies and so on, on the generic drug issue. I'm with you on that one. Go for That's it. That's damnable. Go ahead, please. Okay, Mr. Webster. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I was one of the fellows that uh, was in visiting Mr. Robinson this afternoon talking. I'm an unemployed, versatile Pacific shipyard worker. I uh, feel very frustrated having sitting around waiting for this big contract, and I think that uh, Mr. Robinson is doing a heck of a job, and that's not a plug uh, for him, but at least he's making an effort. I think the West is getting a shaft in all the controversy that I don't we've think had with the CF-18, with Sin Crude, with Don Getty, uh, maybe Skytrain, uh, a few other things that we have. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Okay, I'm with you. Uh, there's no doubt that the Polar Aid icebreaker is going to come here most of the contract. There isn't any doubt about that at all. Cause when? Well, you tell it to some of the boys who have been sitting around for three years. They mm. just laid off 23 people in the management mm. yesterday, didn't they? But well, I'll that's true, but uh, December 19th, I got laid off. There was 53 in our department. Damnable. Damnable. Yeah. Thank and, you, uh, sir. Of course, I went back at the end of January for three days, and uh, right now I'm sitting looking for a year ahead, and I'm frustrated. How old are you? I'm 43 years old, and, uh, you know, maybe I can try and cut it out in the steel industry, but construction in this area in B.C. is down, so... I know, know it's I impossible. No good feelings about the whole prospect. Much obliged, sir. Good call. Yeah. We're all agreed on that one. Yeah. By the way, wasn't Wilson correct in chopping off the financial fiddle that Cuvalier tried to do on the SkyTrain? Yes, he was. Yeah, it was a fiddle, uh, and uh, the province should have consulted with the federal government before they, uh, they got into it. Uh, the people that invested in good faith aren't to be blamed. They're the ones that got burned in the thing. And uh, I don't often praise the Tories, but I think Wilson did the right thing on this. Sven, I hate to be personal, but you're beginning to look your age. I remember when you were, you know, a, a clean-shaven, uh, jolly-cheeked young man, and now you're 34 and just Do about over there. Try not to get in trouble with the law again. I'll do my best, Pops. My thanks to Sven Robinson, NDP MP for Burnaby. Next, Leslie Nielsen and Nanette Fabre. After the break. The chair for that to slip in. Better to slip in here. Yeah, you slip in. Will you? This old, the 85 year old man. <laughs> then it fabric. Was si yes. Just a little bit. She's it. Right 
Tiny troubles. Taking care. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear them. This weekend at the Queen Elizabeth Theatre, Saturday and Sunday, is the 21st. Annual oh. Variety Club Telethon, <laughs> and has raised <laughs> more. <laughs> he's been more doing this for years too, ladies and gentlemen. More for years money than he's been doing any <laughs> other similar telethon anywhere in the world. And the Variety Club, of course, raises all these wonderful monies to benefit disabled and or disadvantaged children. And I have two guests here. One of them here right now, Eric Nielsen's younger brother. How do you like being introduced like that? That's okay. Go ahead. Doesn't hurt me anymore. <laughs> I've finally, uh, you know, I've, I've beaten it. It used to always be, you know, Leslie Nielsen's brother, but, uh, you know. Now it's Eric Nielsen's brother. Now it's brother. Eric Nielsen's brother. There's a big difference between the two of you, you know. There is. What is it, uh, Jack? I know you'll tell me. You talk. How is it that you have two microphones and I only have one? You talk. Do you have trouble being understood? <laughs> you talk. <laughs> and he doesn't talk. It, oh, really? The best he thing you've done. To me. What was that variety, that pa parody you did on the police department? No. Police Squad. Police Squad. Yes, did you like that? I loved that. I have marvelous news for you. What's that? We are now, they are writing it, the same guys who did Airplane and Police Squad. They are writing a feature on Police Squad. It's going to be absolutely bonkers. It'll be Police Squad from the failed TV series. You've <laughs> done a lot of police work on the, on the I movie. I, I certainly have. Now, how many times have you been up for the tele telethon? This is my first time here for the telethon. First time telethon. But I came up here when we had the roast for, uh, for High, for High Eisenstadt, which is a different function. Came up for the uh, golf tournament in Calgary, and they're going to have that again this year. And so a lot of variety club stuff. Yeah. And you came up for one in which uh, we almost co-starred together. What was that? You can't even remember it. Yes, I can. No, you Refresh can't. Refresh my memory. <laughs> Black yes. Light Magic. Yes, you mean with Diane Dupuis. Yes, yes. You, did the narration. you did the narration one night at one time, and I did it the next night. I don't recall that, Jack. Y you can't remember that? Sharing the, the stage it, with no, me? Did you ever do that narration? I don't believe you did. I did it in perfect English. They told me that, <laughs> <laughs> that they used They told me that they were not going to let you go on stage. <laughs> now, uh, you don't have to work anymore, but what are you doing these days? I have just finished. I finished a feature with Barbara Streisand called Nuts, which will be out on Christmas time. I finished one here called Home is Where the Heart Is, and I finished one in Toronto called Calhoun. Where's the and, name? Uh, so I'm busy working. They're still exercising bad judgment in my, my case, you understand? That's good. You never want a hoofer, though. A what? You can't sing it. Hoofer. You, I'm hard of hearing, Jack. <laughs> hoofer. Who's he? Sing, song and dance man. Oh, yes? You, you, never mean Robert, you mean Robert Preston, don't you? Yeah, you look a little bit like him. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid you, I do. You've got the same kind of nose <laughs> as Robert. Yes, Brett. I'm sure it runs in my family. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to take a little break. We're going to bring Nanette in, um, Nanette Fabre, and then we'll go to the phones instantly the moment Nanette comes up and I have a little chat with her. Very good. I'm just After the break. It's a brand new total. Two million six hundred and ninety-nine thousand one hundred and one dollars. With me, with me now, <laughs> with me now is the incomparable <laughs> Nanette Fabre, famous award-winning actress, a mother and homemaker, a hard-working humanitarian. I'm told that you're actually perfect in every way, shape, and form. It, it is so hard to be perfect. I mean, you know, it was such a thing to have to live up. I thought I made a mistake once, but I was wrong. No, <laughs> everybody knows you too nowadays, and even I watch you because I'm big on that kind of thing. Catherine Romana, one day at a time. One day at a time. Yes. In fact, I, it's running up here, I believe. It, it is, yes. Yes, yes. You stopped making them, have you? Yes, well, it ran nine years. You have a loud voice. I find myself shouting at you. Should I, should I do that? Hello, <laughs> Leslie. <laughs> you, you speak well, ma man. You really He's do. He's got two microphones. Yes. Sir. Yes. Sir, excuse me, sir. I speak very well indeed. Yes, you do. Because I'm very lucky to come from an ethnological background where the shape of my epiglottis allows me to be very distinct 
and I speak possibly the best English in this country. Yes. Are you, you from Scotland? I'm from Scotland. Yes. Well, my name is McDougal, so I understand what you're saying. You're really a McDougal? Yes, yes, yes. Nanette McDougal doesn't sound <laughs> right. <laughs> Who is Fabre? <laughs> That was the other part of me, too. Oh, that was the other part of you. Yes. And yes. that's McDougal. Yes. Really? Yes. yes. Three that's Emmys. That's my married name. Your married name. Yes. Three Emmys. What were these yes. three Emmys for? For the, my work with Sid Caesar. Uh huh. That was uh, 19, the 19, early, middle, middle 50s, 1950s. Oh, you weren't around then. Yes, I was. Were you? Yes. And the other two? Yes. Well, they, they were all three for it, work with Sid Caesar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me something, though. Yes. You're on the President's Committee. For the handicapped. Two, yes. I serve in, th that's one of the reasons I'm so happy to be up here for the uh, Variety Club telethon that we're having. Mm -hmm. It has to do with the uh, disadvantaged children. And uh, what I do in the States is I serve on the President's Committee on Employment of the Handicapped, uh, the President's National Council for the Handicapped. We oversee all federal programs that have to do with handicapped people and try to uh, mainstream them, get them jobs, get them back on their feet. And uh, I, I work on that full time. Now, kindly match that, Leslie Nielsen. I couldn't begin to. I'm Can you I think. Oh, yeah, you but do. I, I, <clears throat> my heart is in the right place, put it that way. And I, I attend many charity functions myself. I must tell you, at home in the States, every time there's a something worthwhile that has to be done, you will see Mr. Nielsen's name there. He's a, he serves well. He well, really does. He, had a, he has a brother. Yes, I know. Two of them. Oh, Eric is one of the toughest guys. Fantastic there. sense of humor. Oh. Yes. He's got a marvelous sense yes. of humor. He never showed it with me. He showed it with me. The most you can get out of him is yes or no. Well. But a very good politician, very big conservative probably politician. Probably ask very simple question. Well, I try and keep my <laughs> questions simple indeed. <laughs> I'm in a movie this year. You did? Mm -hmm. Were you good? Uh, well, I was playing a part of a crooked television announcer, somehow or other. Uh-huh. And I was involved with Nazi crown jewels in a cave. And I get stabbed <laughs> in the cave. So they stabbed me. Where is your me. cave? You get stabbed in the oh, cave? Oh, this is on a set somewhere. Oh, I see. Yes, I so I get stabbed in the cave. And trying to act like Leslie Nielsen, I fell over backward and demolished the wall of the cave. Uh. <laughs> and that's from being stabbed in the back, of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> uh. With the jewels. Well, I think everybody's delighted that you're up here for the, yes. the telethon. What are you going to be doing in the telethon? Uh, well, I'm, we're f I'm finding out now. It's, uh, you know, Nanette, I'm, I'm what are you going to be doing on the telethon? Well, I found out we're both in the opening number. Okay. Yes, we're going to sing. We're I'm going to sing, sing one line, yes. badly, but I'll sing. I'll and try. then I'm doing two numbers. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to sing two songs in sign language. And I'm hoping that I will sing the songs with, with, uh, with the two small, two, uh, some, two some small children. Well, that's great. Yes. The sign language, of course, is something which can never be replaced for truly profoundly deaf people. Yes, it can. In the States, we have, and I think you have them up here now, we have a new operation called a cochlear implant. Matter of fact, I just did a piece on it a couple of weeks ago that started to do mm -hmm. the cochlear implant yes. up here. They take absolutely, completely deaf, profoundly deaf people and uh, bring back a sense of hearing. Yeah, but there's got to be something left in the fibers. No, no, no. no it this operation completely bypasses the whole hearing mechanism and brings electrical stimulation directly to the brain. Mm -hmm. It's very fascinating. It's remarkable, but can the, does it provide hearing or the sensation no, of the no, feeling? No, no, no. It provides hearing. You see, all but hearing of, is electrical. But one of the difficulties is that if it's not been done until you're, say, a young adult, apparently it's almost diff impossible to learn the speech. If you've lost your hearing, they can bring it back because you know how to speak. Is that not one of the difficulties? That's one of the things. Losing your hearing after you've heard speech is called being adventitiously deaf, ah. as was Helen Keller. That's how she remembered the word water. Uh, what we do, we, uh, I say we because I'm on one of those boards, we have implanted about three or 400 children between two and three years of age, uh, four years of age, and they learn speech with this new artificial hearing so that they can be mainstreamed in the public school s system. It's incredible, incredible. incredible. Mm -hmm. And yes. at that age, does it grow with them? Is it a one-time no, no, thing? No, no, or does no, it no, no, no. It's an <coughs> electronic thing that is put L inside your ear. It's a little little electronic thing. that mm -hmm. And it has a little battery somewhere else, yes. as I recall. Mm -hmm. Very good indeed. Yes. Let's go to the phone. What are you going to sing for the, have you decided what you're going to sing? On yes, but I want it to be a surprise. But you want it to be a surprise. Yes, yes. I brought my music with me. Go ahead to my jests, please. Yes, Jack. I'd like to thank Eric Nielsen, uh, Leslie, rather, I'm sorry. That's okay. For many hours of uh, pleasure. Thank you. And 
one one comment on Eric. <laughs> I thought it was very wise of him to bow out, out of the central arena just before all the bombs. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not taking any snarky political remarks about your brother. Come on, he's fair game. I don't know nothing. I came to stay another six months. Go ahead, please. <laughs> yes, Jack? Yep. I'd like to thank Mr. Nielsen and Ms. Fabray for coming up to Vancouver. I'm sure that they're going to help the show a great deal and okay. help to uh, uh, promote uh, their worthy cause. My uh, question is directed at Ms. Fabray. Yes. I saw you on a talk show, I think it was a year or so ago, and you were talking about when you were doing a live production of Partridge in a Pear Tree. <laughs> and I never laughed so much in all my life because I could picture everything that was happening because the show was live. I'd like to know, is it ever at all possible that we're going to be able to get a tape of that show? Well, it's owned by the Smothers Brothers, and uh, I, did, I did that on their show live with all of the things that you mentioned in the 12 Days of Christmas, 12 cows right. and all the Lords of Leaping. Maybe someday they might rerun it as one of the great moments because it really was. Not because I was in it, but it was something that had never been done before. And it well, was funny. It was why funny. don't you share the experience with us, Nanette? You don't have enough time. That's just what I was going to say. Well, yes. do the first two days. Go on. I'll give you, better to do I'll give you one, the very first thing that happened. Okay. The very first thing is a, a partridge in a pear tree. They, they couldn't find a partridge, so they brought a cute little pigeon in. And I ran up to him. It's all pre-recorded. I ran up to this little artificial wooden tree, and here's this little pigeon sitting there. And I said, and a partridge in a pear And the bird took one look at me <laughs> and flew away. <laughs> So they didn't know what to do about it. So the man says, don't worry. He took his net and he caught the pigeon. They brought him back and they <laughs> tied him to the, to the branch, to this little wooden stick. So now we're trying it again, see? So I came running up to him and I said, and a partridge in the per bird took one. And he goes, ha ha, and tried to fly away, but he's tied. And he just went, chew, like this. And he's hanging upside down with one. That was just the first creature. Imagine with seven swans a swimming, eight maids a milking. You know, I mean, it was hysterical. It was hysterical. Thank you very much. Oh, that's funny. Go ahead, please, to the new firm of Nielsen and Fabre. Uh, hello, Jack. Uh, first of all, when you were stabbed as being the crooked TV uh, person, you didn't get stabbed in the tongue, did you? <laughs> uh, I would like to tell Miss Fabre that I have enjoyed her so much. Television was late coming to BC, and it was about 1953 or 4, yes. and uh, I enjoyed her then. I enjoy her now. I've read about her life and her the loss of her husband, yes. and um, I have nothing but admiration, and I and I thank you for coming and gracing uh, the Variety Club stage. You'll be sure to watch and tomorrow. to okay. Leslie Nielsen, I would like to ask have how many features movies and tv have you been in and could you please look out for a spot for a struggling older man who can do a pretty mean scotch accent god bless <coughs> uh, you know it's a fact i do not know why i have never been discovered by hollywood can you explain it probably <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who's that? Am I going to answer that one question? Yeah. She so asked, how many movies and TV shows that I've done? Yeah, please. I think somewhere, it's going to be a wild, long guess, though, because it's somewhere around 1,200, maybe 1,500. I'm not sure, but it's in that Is area. that counting each segment of a series? Or no, just no, that's counting. Kind of some of them are segments wow. in series. There are only about 100 of them. All of them are mainly one shots. My gosh. Yeah, oh my that's God. what I often say. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you how old you are. You can ask me. How old are you? I can oh, tell you. You don't even know how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say I'm over 60. So am I. Yes. But how much over 60? Well, there's a guess. <laughs> not me. I'm yeah. older than you. Considerably older than you. No, you're not. You're over 50. No, over 60. Over 60? Yes. Shh. My birthday was yesterday. Was Your speaking. birthday was yesterday. Day before yesterday. Day before yesterday. Many happy returns. Thank you. Very kind. Yes. 52nd yes. birthday. Yes. 52nd. The next call comes from a place with the unlikely name of Likely, B.C., the site of the biggest placid gold mine in British Columbia's uh, history. Go ahead, please. Yes, you're absolutely right there, Jack. There's nothing I don't know. Oh. <laughs> Carry on. Yeah, thank you, Jack. That's very, very nice. This is Likely. And uh, Eric there, are, are you from... Eric. Leslie, Leslie, you fool! Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Leslie. Are you from Edmonton originally, by any chance? Well, not originally, but we came out of the north to a, a small town 
Thornhill, north of Edmonton, then I ended up going to high school in Edmonton. Nanooka, the north. Uh, uh, oh, yes! <laughs> Nanooka. He didn't Nanooka. live down below the, uh, below the uh, Mackay Avenue High School in Edmonton? Victoria High School, right. Well, for God's sakes. You bet. Uh, you were very interested in my uh, the girlfriend, uh, Vera Nightingale. We had a little uh, competition. These things do get around. Today, and uh, <laughs> I'd like to tell you that I won, uh, by the way. Uh, it, well, did you marry Vera Nightingale? I married Vera Nightingale, and you and I had our little time there. You lived down the hill. I was going to throw rocks at you there once in a while, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, I took her away from you. Hey, I've enjo we've enjoyed all your shows, by the way. Absolutely fantastic. We've Thank followed you. you all over the world. Vera enjoyed them, too, I believe. Uh, pardon? I say Vera enjoys them, too, I believe. Oh, yes, 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 you bet. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Vera. still living in Edmonton. Give my love to Vera. Thank I you. I certainly will. Thank well, you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank, you, lot. Thank you a lot. Go on forever. Thank you. <laughs> Vera Nightingale. Na go ahead, please. Yes. Jack? Yes, yes. Oh, uh, this is na na Nanette Fabre. Yes. Um, I'm glad to, to hear that you talk about the, the, the healing uh, disabilities. Yes. I'm hard of healing. Uh-huh. Talk funny like Jack, of course. Scotch. Uh, the, the thing is that uh, this new implant, uh, is it only for the young ones or is it for older ones? No. no. If you have any hearing, they won't, do the Im the, they won't do the cochlear implant on you. But if you have a hearing problem, you should go look into a, having a hearing aid. Yeah, but they're tricky, but let's not get into discussion of that at the yeah. moment. Anyway, yeah. give me a call off here and I'll tell you who you should go and see. Uh, go ahead, please. Um, for Mr. Nielsen, I wanted to congratulate you for all the work you've done, even though I haven't seen probably your 1,200 uh, movies. Um, but I wanted to tell you that it was really fun watching you in airport. All the airport movies you have done, they were just hilarious. Yes. That was great. Did you watch so did, much. Did you watch Police Squad at all? Um, I don't remember if I've seen that or not. Oh, if you saw that, you would never, ever forget it, would you? Airplane, uh, it was written, uh, Police Squad was written by the same guys, and we are now doing, in June, we will begin shooting a feature. Uh, on p police squad, so... Well, let me give my plug quickly. My grateful thanks to Nanette Fabre and to my old friend, I met him three times, <laughs> Leslie Nielsen. <laughs> and the television coverage on BC TV starts at 8 p.m. Saturday night for the 21st Annual Variety Club Telethon to raise more millions, which is Saturday and Sunday at the Queen Elizabeth Theatre. And don't hesitate to go down at any time of the day or night and enjoy the fun. Yes, thank you, you very much, Nanette. Oh, it was and wonderful. to you too, Leslie. Yes. Thank you oh, very much. Thank you. After the break. Monday we go to Fleet Street to three top Fleet Street editors of the Sunday Express, the Daily Express and the Star. And we're also going to do a shot on how Vancouver is going to dispose of its 300,000 tons of garbage over which there is some concern in various parts of the interior of British Columbia. So that's Webster on Monday at 5 p.m. precisely.